Good day everyone, welcome back to our uh, lecture video series in ethics. At this uh, point, we will be focusing on the modifiers of human acts. In the previous lessons, you have um, discovered that ethics is mainly focused on um, the morality of human acts. Okay, And human acts are those actions that are done from the deliberate free will of a person. And that entails that a human act must constitute um, three things in order for it to be considered human. And there are, and these three three things are knowledge, freedom, and voluntariness. Now let us uh, try to look closely at this point into the modifiers of human acts. So, what are these modifiers of human acts? What um, do they um, refer to? What do they mean? So the modifiers of human acts, they refer to the things that may affect the human act's essential qualities, lessening their moral, uh, moral character of the act and consequently diminishing the responsibility of the agent. So from its name, modifier, these uh, things, these factors, somehow alter or change the quality of a human act. Okay, it alters the moral character of the act, and as a consequence, it also diminishes the responsibility of the agent uh, or of the doer of that certain act. So there are five modifiers of human acts. First, there is ignorance, there is concupiscence, fear, violence, and habit. So let us consider um, each one of them and let us try to find out how they modify uh, human acts. First, ignorance. Generally, ignorance means the lack or absence of knowledge. Okay, so ignorance is uh, the privation of knowledge. When knowledge is absent, then ignorance uh, exists or of course. So ignorance um, only has a kind of uh, accidental existence, meaning to say it does not exist in itself. It, it only exists when uh, knowledge does not exist. So there are classifications of ignorance. First, negative ignorance. This is absence of intellectual knowledge in man. Okay. Example, a philosophy teacher lacks knowledge about higher mathematics. Simply, if um, that kind of knowledge is not present in you, then you have what you call negative ignorance. Privative ignorance, this is absence of knowledge that ought to be present. So this is um, the lack of knowledge of something which one should know. Example, a licensed civil engineer lacks knowledge about quantifying the strength of materials. So as a civil engineer, one is supposed to know that, one ought to know that, but then uh, he lacks knowledge of that, so then the ignorance is called privative ignorance. Lastly, there is positive ignorance. This is presence of a false knowledge. So this can also refer to as a mistake or error. Example. You mistook a stranger for someone you know because you have poor eyesight. So there is something known, but this knowledge of something is false. And therefore, there is still lack of knowledge of what is supposed to be the truth. This is positive ignorance. Okay, Ignorance can also be considered in three ways. First, ignorance in its object. Second, ignorance in its subject, and lastly, ignorance in its result. What do we mean by each one of them? Ignorance in its object. This concerns the thing of which the agent may be ignorant about. Okay, So the very object or the very thing that the agent or the knower is ignorant about. Ignorance in its object comes in three types. Ignorance of law, Ignorance of fact and ignorance of penalty. Ignorance of law. 
refers to the ignorance of the existence of a duty, a rule, or a regulation. Whether that um, rule is a kind of a moral rule or whether that is a kind of a civil rule. Example, not knowing the recreation, that recreational use of marijuana is the, in the Philippines is illegal is a certain type of ignorance called ignorance of law. So the law that prohibits the recreational use of marijuana in the Philippines is present, but then as the agent or the knower, one does not know that, then that is ignorance of law. Ignorance of fact. This refers to the ignorance or of the nature or circumstances of an act as forbidden. It is also lack of knowledge that what one is actually doing comes under the prohibition of a known law. Example, your friend wrongly gives you information about his address to attend his birthday party, resulting to you crashing into a different address. So um, this is simply lack of knowledge of the facts that fall under a certain cir a circumstance that which maybe is prohibited under a certain law that is ignorance of fact third ignorance of penalty this is a lack of knowledge of the precise sanction affixed to the law so simply your lack of knowledge to the exact punishment or penalty which is affixed uh, to a certain law example not knowing the penalty of not wearing face shields when going outside while quarantine po uh, policies are in, uh, being implemented so uh, these three types of ignorance uh, falls under ignorance in its object next there is ignorance in its subject so this pertains to the ignorance which exists in the agent or the knower so the ignorance um, present in the one who does not know something there are uh, two types of ignorance in its subject we have vincible ignorance and the other one invincible ignorance first vincible ignorance this is ignorance that can be dismissed by the use of ordinary diligence so by the uh, name vincible that could also mean surmountable so by use of ordinary diligence through one's own effort one can dismiss or dispel this kind of ignorance vincible ignorance results due to lack of proper diligence on the agent and is the fault of the agent so um, due to lack of diligence uh, due to lack of uh, efforts to overcome such ignorance okay, that is the cause of vincible ignorance and therefore the agent is uh, at fault for having this kind of ignorance that's why this is also called culpable ignorance okay, so from the term culpable in latin the word culpa means fault so there are different degrees of vincible ignorance First, we have crass ignorance. It is also called stupid or gross ignorance. Ignorance is crass if it be the result of total or nearly total lack of effort to dispel it. So uh, there is absolutely no effort uh, done to dispel such ignorance. Example, a grocery sales attendant simply guesses the price of an, un of an item when asked about it. So in this case, the sales attendant does no effort to dispel the ignorance he has about the price of a certain item in the grocery okay so he is culpable for that then there is simply vincible ignorance this is when some efforts were done but not persevering the agent unsuccessfully dispels this kind of ignorance so there are some efforts made or done, but not lasting and not persevering. And therefore, the agent is not successful in dispelling such ignorance. Example, the same grocery sales attendant, when asked about the price of an item, 
glances at the price of nearby items and assumes the same price for the item in question. Okay, in that case, the sales attendant has a simple, a simply vincible ignorance. And lastly, affected ignorance. This is present if positive effort is made to retain such ignorance. So there is an, an, an intentional uh, effort done to retain such kind of ignorance. Example, the same grocery attendant, now reprimanded by the store manager, does not make the effort to dispel the ignorance he has about the price of the item in question. So he is kind of positively and intentionally uh, retaining the ignorance he has. And that is affected ignorance. So these three are types of vincible ignorance, which is ignorance in its subject. The other type of ignorance in its subject is called invincible ignorance. This is ignorance that ordinary and proper diligence cannot dispel because of the following reasons. First, the agent has no realization whatever of his lack of knowledge. Second, the agent who realizes his ignorance finds ineffective his effort to dismiss it. So from the name invincible, so this is the opposite of invincible. So it could also mean, mean unsurmountable. This is unsurmountable or it cannot be overcome because of the reasons stated. Therefore, this is not the fault of the agent, which is why it is also called inculpable ignorance. The agent cannot be blamed for having such ignorance. There are degrees of invincible ignorance. First, physically invincible, and there is physically uh, morally invincible. Physically invincible ignorance is present when no human effort can dismiss it. For example, it would be um, impossible to know everything that is written in each and every book that exists in the world. That is simply uh, physically invincible. Morally invincible ignorance is present when it would be extremely difficult to dismiss it even with the aid or the help of some good and prudent men. So even with the assistance of good men, such ignorance cannot be dismissed or dispelled. That is morally invincible. So um, vincible ignorance and invincible ignorance, again, are types of ignorance in its subject. The ignorance that exists in the agent or the one who is supposed to have knowledge of things. Lastly, there is ignorance in its result. This refers to acts performed while ignorance exists. So the corresponding acts that are being performed while ignorance exists. There are three types, antecedent ignorance, concomitant ignorance, and consequent ignorance. First, antecedent ignorance. It is that which precedes all consent of the will. So from the word antecedent, it means prior or before. So antecedent ignorance, it comes before the consent of the will. Example, a driver of a car at night who, exercising every reasonable care, yet knocks down a pedestrian whom he did not see. That ignorance is antecedent. Um, because the agent... Um, did not will such uh, ignorance. It, it precedes the consent of the will. So um, when knocking down the pedestrian whom he did not see, um, the, the, the ignorance that accompanies that action, or rather the ignorance that exists while performing that action is called antecedent ignorance. Second, concomitant ignorance. It is that which accompanies an act that would have been performed 
even if the ignorance did not exist. An act, an act done in concomitant ignorance is and must be non-voluntary. Okay. So, if antecedent ignorance comes before the cons consent of the will, concomitant ignorance accompanies okay, the action itself. Okay. An action that would have been performed even if the ignorance did not exist. Example, a car driver who decided to kill an enemy long before ends up hitting and killing a pedestrian who turns out to be his enemy, the person whom he wants to kill at night. Okay, so there was the intention of killing an enemy before. But then one night, the driver drives his car and then by some coincidence, he ends up hitting and killing a pedestrian who turned out to be the enemy he wanted to kill. So, upon hitting and killing the pedestrian, the ignorance that accompanies that act is called concomitant ignorance. Or rather, the ignorance that exists is concomitant. It accompanies the action. And then there is consequent ignorance. It is that which follows upon an act of the will. The will may directly affect it or crassly neglect to dispel it. So consequent means after. So consequent ignorance follows the consent of the will, follows upon the consent of the will. It stems from the consent of the will. So the will may directly affect it, so it becomes affected ignorance, or crassly neglect to dispel it. So it becomes crass ignorance. Example, a car driver, feeling like driving fast in the middle of the night, is either deliberately or carried away by his pleasurable emotions and does not look at his speedometer. So that the car driver no longer knows um, that he's running at a very fast speed. Now that ignorance is consequent, okay, because he deliberately, um, deliberately tries to retain that ignorance, or he class crassly neglects it because he is uh, carried away by his emotions. That is consequent ignorance. So to help you out, ignorance and its result follow this pattern before that is antecedent ignorance, during the act, that is concomitant ignorance, and after the consent of the will, that is consequent ignorance. That is ignorance in its result. Now, how can ignorance modify or affect the moral character of a human act? So here are the ethical principles on ignorance. First, invincible ignorance destroys the voluntariness of an act. This means that an act, insofar as it proceeds from invincible ignorance, lacks voluntariness, is not a human act, and is not imputable to the agent. So because we said invincible ignorance is um, impossible to dispel, because either the agent has no knowledge of his ignorance, or the agent realizes that whatever effort he makes is ineffective to dispel such ignorance. Because of that, the ignorance um, is invincible, then it destroys the voluntariness of the act. Because take note, again, voluntariness only occurs when there is first knowledge and freedom. But since here there is um, total lack of knowledge, which is invincible, then voluntariness is also destroyed. Therefore, it is not a human act. And therefore, it is not imputable to the agent. So the act that comes from invis invincible ignorance is not ascribable to the agent. The agent cannot be blamed or praised for such an act. Second, Vincible ignorance does not destroy the voluntariness of an act. This entails that the agent has knowledge that bears indirectly upon the act which he performs in ignorance. 
and the act has in consequence at least indirect voluntariness and is a human act imputable to the agent. So vincible ignorance, because it can still be dispelled okay, by way of the agent's uh, use of proper diligence, there is still a certain degree of voluntariness to the things he does out of vincible ignorance. And therefore, those acts are still human acts imputable to him as the agent. Third, vincible ignorance lessens the voluntariness of an act. So, though it does not destroy the voluntariness of the act, it only lessens the voluntariness of an act. While vincible ignorance does not destroy the voluntariness of an act, it lessens voluntariness. And because it lessens voluntariness, consequently, it diminishes the responsibility of the agent. Take note, it only diminishes or decreases the responsibility of the agent. So, a person who does something out of vincible ignorance is not fully responsible for such action. Lastly, affected ignorance in one way lessens and in another way increases voluntariness. So despite the bad will which it implies, affected ignorance is still lack of knowledge, direct and perfect, and lessens the voluntariness of the act that proceeds from it. So although it is um, positively um, made to be retained, it is still a lack of knowledge. And therefore, it is still a, 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 because it is still lack of knowledge, um, the voluntariness of the act is somehow lessened. Okay? But on a different sense, if being deliberately fostered to serve as an excuse for a fault against a law, it shows the strength of the will's determination to persist in such faults, thus increases the voluntariness of an act that proceeds from it. So if an agent deliberately tries to make this affected ignorance as a kind of excuse or an, uh, a justification for something he has done against a law, then it shows that his will has the determination to persist to persist in such wrongdoing. And therefore, it increases the voluntariness of the act that proceeds from it. So, in that way, affected ignorance both lessens and, in an, uh, and increases voluntariness. These are the principles uh, in really uh, principles on ignorance as a modifier of human act. Next, we have concupiscence. What is concupiscence? It refers to those bodily appetites or tendencies which are called the passions, such as love, hatred, joy, grief, desire, horror, hope, despair, courage or daring, fear, and anger. So concupiscence, they are the bodily tendencies, okay? inclinations, okay? Uh, tendencies that um, incline us to certain things. So these, they are also called the passions or the emotions. Concupiscence can be classified into either antecedent, and consequent concupiscence. First, antecedent concupiscence. This is present when um, passions spring into action unstimulated by the will act. Okay, so again, antecedent means before. So these are passions that occur or that emerge into action but they are not stimulated by the will act. They come before the will makes a consent. Okay. Example, the automatic feeling of awe over a wonderful scenery. So when you go to a very beautiful place and then you are amazed, you stand in awe 
over the wonderful, beautiful scenery in front of you, then that feeling of awe is an antecedent concupiscence. Okay? It comes before the consent of the will. Second is consequent concupiscence. Okay? These are passions which are directly or indirectly stirred up or fostered by the will. So it is the will which stimulates these passions or emotions. And therefore, they come after the will makes a consent. Example, getting angry on the teacher who is retained for a long time. Okay, so the, the feeling of anger is something that is uh, stirred up by the will. That is consequent concupiscence. Now, on the one hand, antecedent concupiscence is an act of man. Okay, especially when antecedent concupiscence is so great. It no longer is a human act, it becomes an act of man. And therefore, it is a non-voluntary act which means that the agent is not responsible for it. On the other hand, consequent concupiscence is the fault of the agent, for it is willed either directly or indirectly, either in say or in causa. Therefore, the agent, as a result, is responsible for it. So here are the ethical principles of concupiscence. First, Antecedent concupiscence lessens the voluntariness of an act. This means that antecedent concupiscence disturbs the mind and hinders the calm judgment of the mind upon the moral qualities of an act, thus impairing knowledge which is needed for perfect voluntariness. Okay, So because it somehow distorts the mind's uh, capacity to make a sound judgment, it impairs knowledge. But then again, full and perfect knowledge is needed for perfect voluntariness. And when um, knowledge is impaired, now voluntariness is also defective. And this is because of antecedent concupiscence. So it lessens the voluntariness of the act. Okay. Antecedent concupiscence is a strong and sudden urge to action, and thus it lessens the full and prompt control that the will must exercise perfectly. Hence, it also impairs freedom. Now, since knowledge and freedom are impaired by it, the voluntariness of an act is thereby lessened, and in consequence, it diminishes or decreases the responsibility of the agent. Okay. So again, um, because antecedent concupiscence lessens voluntariness, it also decreases the responsibility of an agent. So if an agent does something out of antecedent concupiscence, he is not fully responsible for it. He is only partially responsible. Second, antecedent concupiscence does not destroy the voluntariness of an act. Although knowledge and freedom are lessened by it, they are not destroyed, and the agent's responsibility, while diminished, is not cancelled. So there is still responsibility. There is still voluntariness. However, if the antecedent passion is so great as to make control of the agent's acts impossible, then the agent is temporarily insane and his acts are not human acts but acts of man. So if there is a um, great degree of passions or concupiscence, if it is to a great degree so that the agent no longer has control over his actions, then the agent becomes, becomes temporarily insane or out, his, out of his mind. In this case, the agent, when uh, the, the things he does, are no longer human acts, but acts of man, man. Third, consequent concupiscence, however great, does not lessen the voluntariness of an act.
So consequent concupiscence is willed directly or indirectly. Thus, the acts that proceed from it have their proper voluntariness. Next modifier is fear. Fear is the shrinking back of the mind from danger. Fear is the anxiety or worry of the mind. From slight disturbance to actual panic brought about by the apprehension of imminent or coming evil. So when you apprehend a certain danger or an evil okay, coming your way, then your mind becomes anxious. It worries. And this is uh, the experience of fear. Now, human acts can be done um, in either way from fear or with fear first acts from fear uh, acts from fear they are actions done caused by fear okay. actions which are caused by fear so the the uh, the cause of the action is itself fear example a student cheats because he is afraid of failing so the reason why, for example, a, a particular student cheats during the exam is because he is afraid of failing the subject. He deems failing the subject as something um, not good for him. Because of that, he cheats. So the action is done from fear. Second, act uh, actions with fear. This is when fear is the accompanying circumstance in doing an act. Example, a student in the act of cheating is afraid of being caught so the fear there accompanies the action so remember acts can either be done from fear or with fear here's the ethical principle on fear as a modifier of human act an act done from fear however great is simply voluntary although it is regularly also conditionally involuntary. Fear does not excuse an evil act which springs from it. Okay, So it does not cancel out the voluntariness of the agent. And therefore, responsibility of the agent is still present. Now, the law of church and state provides that an act done from grave fear, unjustly suffered, and excited directly in order to force the agent to do an act that is against his will is an invalid act or one that may be invalidated. So sometimes uh, out of fear of a certain um, thing that is imposed upon us, we are somehow forced to do such things. However, there are laws both in the church and in the state, that invalidate such acts, okay? especially when the fear we suffer is coming from an evil that is unjustly imposed upon us. Okay, So um, although an act is done from fear, the act becomes invalid because fear is unjustly suffered. However, for most of acts done from fear, they are still voluntary. Therefore, the agent has still responsibility for them. So, um, the last thing we consider relates to violence as another modifier of human acts. Violence is the external force applied by a free cause or a free agent that is, by a human being, for the purpose of compelling or forcing a person to perform an act which is against the person's will. Okay. Example of an act uh, done um, caused by violence, forcing someone to tell a lie at gunpoint. So here is the ethical principle on violence as a modifier of human acts. Acts elicited by the will are not subject to violence. Again, elicited acts 
are those acts that start from the will and are completed by the will. For example, wishing something is an elicited act. Now, elicited acts are not subject to violence. External acts, that means uh, acts that are coming from the will but completed by other faculties aside from the will, external faculties such as bodily uh, faculties, these external acts are, uh, which are caused by violence to which due resistance is offered are in no wise imputable to the agent. Okay. So you are forced to tell a lie at a gunpoint. Okay. Now, although you um, show resistance to it, but then you have no uh, choice because um, you are violently compelled to do it. And therefore, your act of telling a lie is no longer imputable to you as the agent. That is violence. Lastly, the modifier, which is habit. Habit refers to operative habit, which is a lasting readiness and facility born of frequently repeated acts for acting in a certain manner. An example of a habit is the habit of smoking. Okay. Now, here's the ethical principle in habit. Habit does not destroy voluntariness. Acts from habit are always voluntary, at least in cause, as long as the habit is allowed to endure. Now, sometimes we, made our, we make excuses for the things we do because we say they are, we, are, we have done them habitually. But then habit actually does not destroy voluntariness. And therefore, it does not destroy uh, the responsibility of the agent. It does not diminish the responsibility of the agent. An agent is still responsible for an act done out of habit. So these are the five modifiers of human acts. Ignorance, concupiscence, fear, violence, and habit. And the principles we have discussed they, um, enable us to um, understand how these modifiers affect the moral character of human acts.